on the father, and he told him when to go. Verse 2 says, Now the Jews' uh, feast of tabernacles was at hand. What feast is this? Well, there's three actual feasts. You have the main feast of the year. There's the Passover feast. There's the feast of Pentecost, and then there's the feast, this feast that we're talking about here, the feast of uh, tabernacles, or the feast of tents, as some may call it. Why that? Well, they, they were commemorating, they were celebrating um, when they were in the wilderness for about 40, 40 years, uh, where, where they lived in tents. So what they would do, they sort of camped out. They built these little shacks outside, and they camped out for the seven, eight days of, of, the, of the feast. You know, they did that for a while. Another thing they did was uh, the, one of the priests, they would, um, they would get a pitcher, of, a gold pitcher of water, and they would sort of pour it out every day uh, uh, upon the altar to remember the rock the rock that poured out water uh, for the people, you know, how God pre preserved the people during the 40 years. Remember, you know, he was a pillar by fire at night, a cloud by day, you know, how their shoes didn't wear out. That's what the whole point of the Feast of Tabernacles was. The main thing here is that there was going to be a lot of people, thousands of people at, you know, Jerusalem and Judea, and Jesus was, uh, you know, encouraged by his brothers here to go. But see, they had the wrong motivations. In verse uh, 3 we see here, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Now when they say here, your disciples, they're sort of implying something here, or letting me know that they're not really his disciples. They're basically sort of scoffing at Jesus here, his uh, stepbrothers. They said, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. I think they, they were able to witness the works that Jesus did. But I think they probably saw Jesus as sort of a magician or sort of, you know, a guy that can do tricks. They didn't really believe that he was uh, the Messiah. Again, Matthew one twenty five says that, you know, after uh, Jesus was born, Matthew and uh, Mary had other children. It says, I mean, Joseph knew Mary after that. So we know that these guys are, are just, actually not his cousins, but his stepbrothers. Look at verse 4. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So they thought Jesus was sort of about publicity. They thought Jesus wanted to be famous. They didn't understand what Jesus was trying to do, obviously, because they didn't believe in him. That's what verse 5 tells us. For even his brothers did not believe in him. But this was not for long. For long after we see in the book of Acts that they were praying in the upper room, they came to a belief after Jesus died, after Jesus resurrected. I like how the, the Living Bible uh, renders verse 4 here. It says, you can't be famous when you hide like this. If you're so great, prove it to the world. So they basically said, look, Galilee, there's nothing going on here. You need to go to Judea. That's where the people are at. If you want to get your, your gig going, you need to go over there. Isn't it interesting, though, a lot of times in our family, in our own households, there, there will be those that don't believe. You know, how do we behave among them? We need to continue to be a witness to them. I think when people come over, you know, and relatives to our home, a lot of times we tend to sort of, well, we have visitors. It's Sunday. We should stay home and, and be a good, uh, you know, hospitable. We should stay with them, you know, feed them or whatever. I think as Christians, we should be that witness and invite them to church. If they don't want to come, they can stay. And we should ourselves go to church and sort of show them, be that witness by being faithful to, you know, our calling. Not forsaking the gathering of the brethren. Look at what verse 7 says. And this is, this is a strong verse here because it says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. So here I think Jesus started giving them a subtle rebuke. He says, the world cannot hate you because it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You see, Jesus is not of this world. His brothers were of this world. They were going with, with the flow. Jesus was not. That's why their brothers did not have any opposition. He did. And he tells us why. He tells us, well, because he testifies of, of the works of the world. They're evil. John fifteen nineteen says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You see, as Christians, if we're not acting like Christians, the world has no reason to hate us, okay? When the world does hate us, when we have conflict, oppression, whether at work and around the family, it's because we're being Christians, Right? Jesus wasn't concerned about making sort of a public appearance, doing it for himself. He was basically telling him, look, if you guys, whatever you guys do, it doesn't matter. You guys are on, under divine time. 
but Jesus was. Another imp interesting point here is that he gives the bad news as well. Because he says, but it hates me because I testify of it. He testifies of it. He preaches of it. That the works are evil. You know, when we give a gospel without the bad news, without the, you know, sin and turning away from it, repentance, we're giving a sugar-coated gospel. It's like a flashlight without batteries. You know? Light, just like uh, light flashes, you know, reveals, you know, sort of pushes away darkness, so does the gospel with the bad news. It sort of reveals man's sins. We, when we give something uh, without that, we're sort of giving uh, uh, batteries not included in the gospel. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. The power is in the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I like that word power. What does that word mean, that word mean in Greek? You know, it's pronounced uh, uh, dunamis, but that's where we get our word for dynamite. There's power behind the gospel. Without the full gospel, without the, the grace of God, without the bad news, you know, that you know, we're, no, no, not one is good, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? Without that, we don't have a gospel. We need to give the full gospel. In order for, for people to appreciate the good news, we need to give them the bad news, obviously. Right? They're drowning. They need a, a savior. Look at what verse 8 says. You go up to this feast. I am, not go, I'm not, I am not yet going up to this feast. Again, for my time has not yet fully come. It wasn't his time to be given up to them. And it, obviously, specifically in the context, it wasn't his time to leave. I think Jesus was sort of under the split second command of, of his father. Jesus was going to go, but just not alongside them. Verse 9 says, When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Did he take some back roads? Did he leave his caravan at home? Did he go by himself, or did he take uh, the, this, the 12 with him? We don't know. But I think if he would have gone with his brothers, his brothers would probably have used Jesus to sort of, you know, Look, I'm with Jesus, you know, um, we're sort of kind of famous or, or whatever. Jesus didn't want to attract that kind of attention, so he waited for them to go. I like what Psalm 31, 14 says. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Again, Jesus was in God's timing. That, that prompts us a uh, question for us, right? Do we include God in our decision making? Do we put him first? If I could say, do we put Jesus in the driver's seat and we get in the passenger seat or in the back seat? Or, do, or is he still in the back seat? Is he even in the car with us, right? We need to include the Lord in our decision making. James uh, chapter 4, verse 13 to 15 sort of uh, gives us an insight on this. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor, again talking about time, that appears for a little time and, when, and then vanishes away. And look what verse 15 says. Instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. You know, prompting us to put God's will, for, as a Christian, we should do that. We should put God's will before us. I'm not telling you how long to pray about it. We know that Paul prayed about three times for uh, thorn in the flesh. But I don't think there's a number. I think we should always continue to pray. Look for those, uh, those um, open doors, right? That, that green light. And, you know, don't be dismayed when you have a, a closed door. Closed doors are from the Lord, too. He doesn't want you to go through them. He says, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says yes, and most of the time he says wait. Our second part here is in verses 11 to 53. And I titled this, Mixed Feelings in Jerusalem. Here we're going to see uh, several kinds of people. We're going to see the pilgrims that were coming to the feast from outside of a outside of Jerusalem. We're going to see the people, the natives of Jerusalem, the Jerusalemites. We're going to see the religious leaders. We're going to see Nicodemus again pop up in the scene. Nicodemus from chapter 3. Several people and his disciples, of course, are going to be around as well. Mixed feelings in Jerusalem. Verse 11. Then the Jews saw him at the feast and said, Where is he? Jesus was public enemy number one. You know, If they had a newspaper, he would be the guy on the, on the front page. They were still upset about, remember the last chapter, the chapter before 6, verse 5, where Jesus heals the, the, the lame man in the pool of Bethesda? They were still upset about that. Remember they approached the lame man and they said, uh, who, who told, instead of being astonished because this guy had been lame for years, right? 
for over two decades. They were more concerned about this lame man carrying his mat on a Sabbath day than his healing. They were upset about that. They took it to the heart. And they knew, that's why they were looking for Jesus in verse 11. They knew Jesus always pops up in this bi these big uh, feasts. They were waiting for him. Look at verse 12. And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good, others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. He was the talk of the town. Verse 13 says, However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. They were afraid they might get kicked out of the synagogue, or out of the temple. These people might have had some beliefs about Jesus, but they weren't too sure. As Christians, we shouldn't be afraid about Jesus. We shouldn't be Christians. That, that, that are, our testimony is just a whisper. You know? We should not fear the world. We should actually present the gospel the best way that, that we can. We're not to be ashamed of the Lord. These guys were were whisper fighters. Verse 14 says, Now about the middle of the feast, this is about, the feast lasted about seven or eight days. This is about maybe four days in the middle there. It says, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So now it's the time to preach. The Lord had given him a special time to, to preach. We don't know how long the sermon lasted, but Jesus is about to give a sermon and he's going to, it's not so much about the sermon itself as much as it is the reactions that the people have. Okay, all these people that I mentioned earlier before, these witnesses about what Jesus is about to say, you know, they have to make a decision for the Lord, whether to continue not to follow him or to follow him. There, there was no middle ground. It says in verse 15, And the Jews marveled, they were surprised, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? See, Jesus held his own among the, the Harvard students. If You know? He, he, he didn't have a bachelor's or a Ph.D., you know, but he did come from God. He knew the Word of God. And right here where it says, uh, how does this man know letters? It's referring to his grammar. It's referring to the Hebrew. How did he know it? There was a bunch of schools that he could have, you know, uh, the, the Pharisees, Sadducees that they studied. Some were conservative, some were liberal. But they knew Jesus had, had not gone to any of these. It reminds me of a... When Jesus, uh, not that Jesus get, gets lost, but that Mary and Joseph misplace him, right? They forget about him. Where, where do they find him at? He's at the temple, right? He's preaching to the people, even as a child. Jesus knew his stuff because he's the author of the Bible. The, the, the letter is about him, Hebrews tells us. But what does this tell us about us? Do we have to have a PhD, you know, a bachelor's here or in there, you know? I like Dave Hunt. Dave Hunt died about April. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of him, but, you know, he's an awesome teacher, debater, um, he never went to, to Bible college or seminary. Actually, he, he learned in the church. The church primarily fed him. The Word of God fed him. This is, this is, this is our, our, our textbook. The Bible. Is, is school bad? No, it's not. But really, we need to... Um, what, what can I say? Two things. Two requirements, right? The first one should be, right, has God called you? Is God calling you to do this? The Bible says that God called Amos. And Amos was in a... a, a you know, a Bible scholar. He was a fig picker and a shepherd. So was David. You know, God calls us to do several things. That's, that's the first qualification. The second is we need a BA. I'm sorry, but we do need a BA. We need to be born again, okay? Not, not a bachelor's. So see, we need to be saved and we need to be called. Here Jesus is called to preach a message. Verse 16 says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So he's pointing back to the Father here, through the message. Verse 17, If anyone wills to do his will, you shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God, or whether I speak my own authority. So something interesting is doing here is that, go back to the Bible. If what I'm saying is out of context, if I'm saying something out of turn, you should be able to correct me using the Bible, going back to the Word of God. And as us, we should be like the Bereans. What does Acts 17 11 say? You know, you know th these were, uh, you know, they, they tested the Scriptures. You know, they studied to they were more, uh, you know, uh, concerned. So they studied the scriptures. They searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. Something about the Bereans, though, they weren't saved when they were searching the scriptures. They were just Jews. The, the, you know, they hadn't sort of crossed over to accept Jesus yet. But nevertheless, they studied the Bible. They went back to it. What does that say about us as Christians? Do we go back to the Word of God to see, to compare it to truth? This is the filter that we use. This should always be what we go back to. For truth. Verse 18, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but
But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Here he makes another point. If I was here up here just talking about myself, I wouldn't be from God. I would just be here trying to make a name for myself, right? Jesus is saying, look, I'm just pointing back to the Father. I'm pointing back to what he's told me to say. There's a woman out there, I won't say her name. She's a famous a female preacher, female pastor, if you'd call it that. But in her messages, she pauses every five minutes to wait on the audience so that they can clap at her or, or sort of, a, a, you know, sort of like if you have teleprompters here, you know, it's time to clap or it's time to laugh, right? Like comedy shows, right? And I think that's a selfish way to preach the gospel. It's not about us. It's about the Lord. It's not about the messenger. It's about God. And I'd be weary of people that do that. Verse 19 says, Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The point he's trying to make here is that he knew that they were still trying to kill him. He was basically pointing out that they were trying to break the sixth commandment. And what is that? Thou shalt not murder or kill. Verse 20 says, The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Now, we're going to read in la later on in the verses that the people say, it says that the people know that they, he wanted to be, they wanted to kill him, right? These are different people here. These are probably the pilgrims. They were sort of unaware of what the religious leaders in Jerusalem were trying to do. So that's why they say, you know, you're demon-possessed. What are you talking about? Because look at look, verse 21. Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. Again, going back to the, the, the healing of the lame man at the pool. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, talking about Abraham. Circumcision was before the law. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? The thing with circumcision was, the law said, after uh, you know a baby was born, they had to uh, circumcise him on the eighth day, right? Regardless if it landed on Saturday, on the Sabbath, right? So we're sort of, okay, it's, called, it's considered working to circumcise somebody. So what happened? He's basically showing them, look, you don't consider it work or, or doesn't, uh, doesn't make the law obsolete when you do that. Why do you make a big deal when I heal somebody uh, on the Sabbath? They do a partial cleansing by, uh, you know, clipping the, the, the foreskin, but uh, they're making a big deal because, Jesus does a full cleansing by healing somebody on that day. Let's continue here. <clears throat> Verse 23, If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Judge, right? You guys know that word. You know the favorite uh, verse of the unbeliever is, you know, you shall not judge. Judge not lest you be judged. That's also a famous verse for, um, a popular verse for a lot of Christians that are not too into the Word of God, that are kind of ignorant about things, and they're afraid to sort of judge people. You know, the Bible calls us to judge, not to condemn. Not to condemn people. We're not here to condemn anyone. The Lord will condemn one day. That's not our problem. But that word judge also means to assess and evaluate. Okay? And the Lord does call us to judge, but not hypocritically. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2.15. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. As Christians, we need to assess situations. You know, we need to not be afraid. You know, imagine if we didn't judge at all. You know, we'd be like the Corinthians that Paul approached them. You know, you guys are embracing a son, having a relationship with his, his stepmother. You know, th that's not what it's about. We need to be firm. We need to uphold what the Word of God says. <clears throat> Again, we should not judge hypocritically. We see that in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. I don't have the verse up here, but I have the uh, correlating verse there. It says, Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. Yes, but if we stop there, if we just read that, we sort of lose the whole context. We, sh we lose the whole meaning of the verse. We wouldn't tell anybody anything. Verse 2 says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck on your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is it saying not to judge? No, it's saying don't judge hypocritically. Okay? 
If you're living in sin, if you're being unfaithful to your wife or wife unfaithful to your husband, you can't go and tell your brother, you need to stop watching pornography because you're going to go to hell, right? You can't do that. You need to first take the, you know, take the, the plank out of your own eye before we approach people. Look at verse 25. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? This is the verse I was talking about. They were aware, the people from Jerusalem, that they wanted to kill Jesus. The other ones that said, do you have a demon? They were the pilgrims that had just came from different, you know, maybe Greek cities or, or Galilee. Verse 26 says, but look, he speaks boldly. And they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? One thing they saw here is that Jesus spoke with authority. They weren't getting that from, uh, from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders. They weren't getting that. A lot of the things they did was they just come up here, they tell a story, they would give their opinion. My opinion is, or Galileo says this, or Gamaliel says this over here, Nicodemus says this. They had different schools, different opinions. Jesus, when he went up there, he spoke with authority because he's the author of the Word of God. And they, and they sort of, uh, they like that. Another point we see here in verse 26 is that they were, since the rulers weren't doing anything to get him off of the stage, they thought maybe the rulers were agreeing with Jesus. Verse 27 says, However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. I think they were confusing maybe the, the, the first coming with the second coming because they thought that when Jesus came to earth as the Messiah, that nobody was going to know where he came from. That's not so. You know, the first coming, the Bible does say, I think Micah 5.2, that he was to come from Bethlehem. Verse 28 says, Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. So basically, Jesus is addressing the same thing he's addressed before. If you guys knew God, if you guys knew the Bible, that it speaks about me, you would know that I'm coming from God. Verse 29 says, But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. It reminds us of what John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Another translation says, The only begotten God has seen Him. Right? Verse 30, Therefore they sought to take Him, but no one laid a hand on Him, because His hour had not yet come. There it is again. Timing was not, the, it, the timing was not ripe. Verse 31, And many of the people believed in Him and said, When the Christ comes, He will do more signs than these, which, is, which this man has done. Will He do more signs than these, which this man has done. I like how the Living Bible translates it. What miracles do you expect the Messiah to do that this man hasn't done? You know, he hasn't already done. People were starting to believe. You see, Jesus took a step of faith. He went and he preached boldly, right? When we take a step of faith, we're going to gain enemies, no doubt. But we're also going to gain true converts. They're going to see that we're, there's really been a change in our lives. That we're not afraid to speak the truth. Verse 32 says, The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Now they're going to send out the thugs for him, the dogs, you know, the, the bouncers. Verse 33 says, Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks? And teach the Greeks. Jesus was obviously, obviously talking about heaven, talking about the ascension. They thought, when, when it says Greeks here, it could be talking about the Hellenists, the Jews that were, they were, from, they were uh, half Jews, half Greeks, that lived in Greek cities, they were Hellenized. They used uh, the uh, Septuagint, the Old Testament uh, scriptures, uh, Greek and Hebrew into Greek. They didn't understand what Jesus was trying to tell. Verse 36, what is this thing that he said, You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now it's the last day. We go from the middle to the last day. Did the sermon last about three and a half days? I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. But we know we're in the seventh or eighth day of the feast, the last day. And go, let's go back to that, that, that gold pitcher with water. Remember that? The, um, the priest would come. He would pour, pour the water into the altar commemorating that water. Remember that water that sort of God told Moses to speak to? The water opened up and, and you know, water, a river of water came out and they, God preserved them, right? So I'm thinking here, 
Okay, this is happening in the background. And then Jesus says, you know, in verse 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You see how Jesus sort of using that illustration, what's going on in the scenery, to bring something supernatural, just like the bread and the fish. You know, he did that natural uh, uh, miracle to bring about, the, the, to present the living bread himself, salvation. Now again, he's talking about the living water. What, the same thing he spoke about to the Samaritan woman. <clears throat> again, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now this is talking about the Holy Spirit, obviously. He gives us an insight, a little New Testament commentary as to what he's referring to. Now, if we read Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit came. The, you know, the Holy Spirit came in the form of fire. They spoke with tongues. John had already seen this. He had already experienced this. That's why he could give a commentary about it. But they hadn't received the Spirit in that sense yet. Now, I'm going to point to you, I, I saw, I'm going to point to you the threefold ministry of the Holy Spirit. There's three ways that the, the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit. The first one is when he uses that word para, or, you know, para, which means uh, that, that he's with. Right? He's alongside of you. If I had a picture here, it's not inside of you, not above you, but besides you. Right? The Holy Spirit is with us in the sense that he comforts us, that he convicts us of sin. John 14, 16 and 17 says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you, there it is, forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. You see the difference with? And in, then there's the other Greek word used for the Holy Spirit as far as uh, where he's at. It's the word, Greek word epi, you know, which is upon you or above, above you, what we see in Acts chapter uh, 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, not in you, not with you, but upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Some Christians call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism, because what happens in baptism? We're sort of uh, under the water, right? We're under uh, the water. The water is above us. The Holy Spirit is above us, upon us, and we're empowered by the, by the Spirit. You know, we can be used by God greater. And then the last part, which is N, the Greek word N, which means in or within. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we see the Holy Spirit has several ministries on the side of us, inside of us, and above us, right? He works in us. Threefold ministry. In verse 40 or 41, we see sort of division among the crowd. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is a prophet. What prophet? There was supposed to be a prophet that would come before Jesus as sort of a, the forerunner. That was, that was John the Baptist, not Jesus. They said, maybe this was a prophet. Others said, this is a Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Again, they didn't understand the Bible. They, they, they were probably following some tradition. But yes, many prophets came from Galilee, as, as I'll, I'll let you know in a little bit. But see, there's division here. Jesus is prompting them to make a, a choice, either for Jesus or against Jesus. If you go to uh, Matthew 10, verse 34, it tells us, <clears throat> Talking about division. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. And remember, this is the loving Jesus here. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. And what, you know, what does a sword do other than split things in half? right? For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. You know, his brothers. Remember that? He who loves father, his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me uh, receives him who sent me. A lot of stuff there, but really... Jesus is basically saying, if your relationship with your mother, father, brother, whatever relationship you can put here in part A, is better than the, is sort of, if you're putting before Jesus, it's not, you're not worthy to be his follower, according to what he's saying here. 
He wants us to make a decision. He wants us to make him first. He came to bring that sword. Verse 42, to finish up here, it says, Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So now these guys were a little bit more understanding. They knew Jesus had come, was supposed to come from Bethlehem. What they didn't understand is that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Verse 43 says, So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came, the, the, the bouncers, came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to him, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now let's stop there for a minute. Okay, so they're basically telling them, Look, you guys are not us. We, we know what's up. You shouldn't, you know, you should listen to my, our words, not his words. You guys are, are unlearned, right? You don't have trained eyes. So we see people are coming to Jesus. We see bouncers, the, you know, the officers are coming to Jesus. And now we're going to see Nicodemus from chapter 3 pop up here because he's a witness here. He says in verse 50, Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, religious leaders for that matter, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. So what happened there, we see Nicodemus sort of standing for Jesus now, right? This tells me that Nicodemus believed in Jesus. I think maybe he was a little bit scared. I don't, he doesn't reply back to them. But they were wrong when they said that no prophet comes out of Galilee. Okay? Because we see Jonah, he came out of Galilee. We see Nahum came out of Galilee. I mean, even Elijah and Hosea. However, in the Old Testament, it uses uh, uh, different names for cities. But when you research them, it's modern-day Galilee. So they were wrong about that as well. What can we get out of these passages? Well, we see several things. We see that Jesus was under the Father's time. He was under the divine timing. We need to be under God's time. It's His will, not our will, right? Another thing we can take out of this is we need to be bold for Jesus Christ. You know, He didn't care. He took a stand. He had different opinions. As Christians, we're going to have different opinions. But you know what? When we stand back, when we, when we start just whisp being those whisper warriors like everybody else was uh, on the scene during the message, we're not going to be any effect. We're not going to take any effect for, for the Lord, right? We need to take a stand, even if it means that we are hated, like Jesus said. He's told his brothers, you know, you're not hated because you're from the world. Are we of the world? Or are we Christian? Are we standing for Jesus? Or are we still standing for the world? There needs to be a change in our lives. We need to stand for the Lord. And that goes for me too, you know. I'm, I'm, whenever I preach here, I'm preaching to myself, you know. We all need to take a stand for the Lord if people are going to come to know Him, if people are going to come to salvation. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father God, I pray that your word might remain in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that uh, that you continue to use us. I pray, Lord, that you just... Uh... Father, we want to know your will, like Jesus. He was prompted by you, Father God. What is your will for our lives, Father God? What is your permissible will? What is your perfect will? We want to know it. Lord, forgive us, Lord, for not coming before you in prayer as often as we should. Lord, forgive us for having sin that we might not have repented of. Lord, we want to be used by you greatly, Lord, because your timing is soon. Father, we want to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, help us to, by our testimony, by our words, help us to be that Bible that a lot of people are never going to read by our lives. Help us to bring people to you, Father God. Use us. Help us not to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.